Hey, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending where you are in the world. Uh, I'm Karim Harji. Uh, welcome to our webinar on designing and measuring impact investing portfolios. So it's great to see so much interest. I know we have a few people still joining. Um, and so thank you for being here. Today, we're going to discuss how investors can move from intention to design to implementation of impact investing portfolios, regardless of where you are in your journey. We're going to talk about the steps in that journey that an investor can take based on this new publication from Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors that compiles over a decade worth of experience in a comprehensive and yet accessible manner. So we're going to also discuss issues around impact portfolios, impact measurement, and, and much more. So by way of introduction, uh, many of you know that the impact measurement programs, one of the only ones of its kind focused on impact measurement across the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. We also have a particular focus on impact investing and social finance, drawing on our longstanding research and teaching experience in these areas, as well as our two other exec ed programs uh, that we teach. So for today's webinar, I'm joined by Patrick Brio, who is the head of impact investing for Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors. He's the co-author of this handbook alongside Steve Gadecki. Um, and many of you, uh, you know, maybe don't know someone who's played at Wimbledon, but now you do. Um, he was a former professional tennis player um, and played Wimbledon in 2008. And if you'd like to learn more about that, you can ask him in the Q&A. So what we're going to do today um, is provide a bit of an overview of some of the selected handbook chapters. It's 180 pages, um, so we're going to try and give you good value for money um, with key messages from each chapter alongside some practical examples of how you can use the handbook. Um, as well as apply to your own work. And Patrick will explain a little bit more about that shortly as, as we talk about how we've made this very action oriented. We'll also dive deeper into a couple of areas, including impact measurement and management. I had the pleasure of co-authoring two chapters um, with Steve and Patrick. And so we'll talk a little bit about theory of change, impact measurement and management, and share some insights from our teaching um, in these areas. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, your questions. Um, I know several of you have had a chance to read the handbook um, and we'd love to hear what you think, um, how you might be able to use it, what kinds of questions you still have. So we'll spend the last third of the webinar um, responding to your questions. Um, please use the Q&A function um, on the Zoom toolbar to submit your questions um, as we go. Um, and then we'll pick those up in the last third of our webinar. So I'll hand it over to Patrick um, in a minute to introduce the handbook, provide a little bit of context um, around how it came together, why it's really important for this time in particular. But before diving into that, just wanted to acknowledge um, Patrick's co-author, Steve Gadecki, um, who authored the first version of this uh, 10 years ago, which is really at the time when impact investing was just getting going. So I was a frequent user of this initial version as I built out an impact investment advisory service um, in Canada at Purpose Capital. And I would say like confidently, these were the best resources around. So it was really a pleasure um, to support this update and, and be involved in it. And just wanted to give special thanks to Steve for his leadership over the last decade and also in producing, I think this really comprehensive um, and timely resource. So Patrick, thank you for joining us. Um, you know, it's a pleasure to have worked with you and Steve over the last year or so. Um, and maybe I'll hand it over to you to provide a bit of context for the handbook, why it's important at this moment. Just talk a little bit about the, the handbook and, and the roadmap and how we might use some of the practical tools and examples that we're going to run through over the next few slides. Happy to. Thanks, Graham, and thanks for that uh, glowing introduction. Um, from a lot of different standpoints, I would echo the uh, words about Steve and, and yourself, Karim, both of you for your wisdom and friendship over the last two years, uh, many hours in small comp conference rooms in, uh, in New York City. So the handbook, uh, first just briefly, what is it? A two year journey, uh, open source book length guide on not just theory or one particular angle at impact investing, but hopefully the full journey. So it takes in lessons from the first version of this 10 years ago and makes it appropriate for today. One way of thinking about it is a framework of frameworks. Uh, that's a kind of a wonky way to say, we try to take the best practice in theory and uh, in action 
and place it along this journey that you see in front of you. We don't want to recreate anything that's out there, but put it in its place and really help asset owners, uh, mission-driven asset owners as the audience here, to shift their portfolio, uh, to create their portfolio, or at least get started with impact investing. Um, and while the, the audience is asset owners themselves to shift portfolios, obviously very relevant to advisors, uh, intermediaries, asset managers, and, um, and even enterprises themselves. So uh, the way that we're gonna approach this today is there are three components to each of these nodes that you see in front of you. And they each have uh, best practices and theory in each of them. Uh, and then it moves quickly to be practical. And the idea is that this should not just sit on the shelf somewhere, but if it doesn't actually inspire action, then we've actually missed the mark. And so what we've done is developed a, an avatar. Her name is Sophia, apparently the, the most widely used name in the world. And um, we weren't confident in uh, finding one asset owner who's actually built this full journey out. And so we developed this avatar who has taken uh, her uh, hypothetical story and applied each of these things to herself. And so with not only her, but also case studies, we've gone through and, and added some, some meat to how this might play out. Along with that, there are, there's an invitation for you as the reader to apply what Sophia has as well to yourself. So again, in a workbook style, how do you actually do this? Uh, so uh, in, to introduce Sophia, here she is. She is, uh, she sells her fashion business for $450 million. Well done her, right? Uh, establishes a foundation. And as she realized, she looks back on her, her fashion industry experience, she's really bothered by the heavy water usage. So she really wants to hone in on water issues. She starts with grant, grant making, but then really gets frustrated by the lack of scale of the grants as the only tool. She reads about impact investing, she attends a conference and says, okay, I really wanna get started with this. Uh, one tricky element is that her husband has a more traditional view on this topic. So he's got separate buckets of uh, investments in philanthropy, you know, earn money over here and give it away over here. Uh, and we'll see how she tries to build consensus as one of the um, underappreciated elements of developing an impact investing strategy. So how does this look in practice for the reader? And each of these chapters, as you saw, will have a, an exercise. So if the, when, you, when you read through the what chapter, you've got a resource inventory to fill out. Uh, so on the top left here, what are your resources that you're dealing with? Um, and then across the top of this uh, diagram, you have what are the activities that you are pursuing with your uh, resources and what is the impact that you hope to uh, to achieve, and that we'll really focus on those areas for the, the IMM section, impact measurement and management. So as you go through the chapters, the who chapter will focus on a stakeholder map and power analysis, the why is the theory of change, the how is the investment policy statement and actually adding products and specifics to your strategy, and chapter five is uh, again the, the more the evaluation framework, and six is how do you actually do this once you've got a strategy in place. So we'll follow along Sophia's journey and how she's filled out each of these elements along the way. So to start with the what, um, many of you uh, have your own definitions. You've wrestled with the question of what is impact investing. One thing we wanna mention here is that all investments have impact. This is probably the most important concept of the what. Um, and the idea is that no matter what, you, uh, what investments you're making, you are owning companies that have uh, influence on the world and they have supply chains and products and services and uh, boards and employees and they're doing things in the world. So it's not a matter of choosing whether or not to do impact investing. If you, are, if you have investments, if you have assets even, they are doing things in the world. Um, and so the idea is to take ownership of that and shift that towards the net, net positive. The other element here is this, uh, this weaving uh, intersection which is essentially taking the three existing sectors, uh, public, private, and social sectors, and showing how impact investing can play a role in weaving these three, three things together. Certainly there are tools that are more specific to each of these three, but um, the opportunity set is quite significant given this interplay. So how has Sophia actually landed the, the what section? 
she has uh, taken on her res resource inventory and has developed three different categories. Uh, we typically think of resources as financial assets when we're thinking about impact investing, but she's wanting to think about it much more broadly. So the first row is the uh, assets that she has, a lot of her different financial accounts as well as property. Um, the second row is the human capital, uh, or if you're an organization, the organizational capital that you have. So think about your personal background, the values or the mission of your organization. And then the relational capital, the networks that you have, the professional relationships, what kind of influence do you have? And so Fia has taken this on and said, okay, I, I understand these categories. Here are the ways that I want to focus initially, particularly with my financial assets, and then later on really develop out how can I play a role in building the field and using my relationships to that end? So for her financial assets, she's got roughly uh, with her husband, $500 million investment portfolio. She's got a $40 million foundation with a $2 million an annual payout. And then she also has a donor advised fund. So we'll be focusing on that row for the rest of this discussion because we want to focus on the, the investment portion. But uh, the second two are also critical. So things like human capital, her fashion industry experience, for example, or relational capital, she really has a deep relationship with water related charities. And so she's really gonna leverage that when it comes to um, her more catalytic investments. So now is the who, uh, the next node. This is the capital chain. And the idea here is not simply to look at just the customers and beneficiaries at the far right, of how you create impact, but the whole chain in terms of developing uh, and having impact. So you've got your asset owner, which is the target audience for this. You've got the intermediaries as the second two. So advisors are providing services, asset managers are providing uh, products like fund managers. Uh, you have the enterprises that are the portfolio companies of these asset managers, and then their customers and beneficiaries. And this is a, the key message here is, uh, it's important to look at the whole chain when you're thinking about impact. Uh, if I could pause and just tie this into the current moment, we think about the, um, the conversation that's really come to the forefront related to racial equity, for example. And the who is critical to, to this discussion. Uh, so one just simple outworking of this would be, um, historically, there's been a focus on the, um, the entrepreneurs, for example, that have not traditionally accessed capital. And so the focus is on the enterprises as well as who and where are, are these enterprises uh, serving underserved customers or beneficiaries. And so the focus is on the, the two nodes on the right. But interestingly, if you move the, the, the dial back to the intermediaries, there's a, a, a big movement now to focus on how can you think about diversity, equity, and inclusion with the intermediaries that you choose? Certainly who is involved in those intermediaries, but how are they interacting with those uh, that you care to impact? So Sophia has taken this on and thought about her own stakeholder map, which is the resource activity for the end of this chapter. And on the bottom, you've got the capital chain. So she's thinking uh, in particular, she's got to focus on gender equity. So she's going to be putting on a gender lens focus on her, on her capital chain choices. The other elements mentioned her husband who has this more traditional view. She is starting to become involved in a few affinity groups and has developed relationships with some peers that she hopes to be inspired by and even bounce ideas off. She's a little bit concerned um, and she, she's started to develop a bit of a, a misconception and even wants to engage her, her husband related to regulation and fiduciary duty, particularly related to her foundation. How much can her foundation consider uh, mission and how does it balance with the consideration for financial returns? And she's got a, a family attorney who is really a close relationship to both her and her husband that she's hoping will be able to help her on the regulatory front. So when we move from the, the what and the who, um, it's important to then think about the why questions. Um, and so many of you who've been on our previous webinars have heard about theory of change. Theory of change would be familiar um, to a lot of you who've already begun work either in impact investing or impact measurement. And so in this chapter, we really talk about how a theory of change anchors your impact investing strategy. And by identifying your impact goals, you can focus then on the type of approach um, that you'd like to see or, or pursue and think about um, 
what that really looks like in practice. And so theories of change can be fairly broad or fairly amorphous. And what we do in the chapter is talk about how you translate that into a set um, of you know, really specific things that you can act on. Um, and as we'll, we'll see with Sophia's example, how you take some of her intentions, her context, translate that into a set of goals that guide their selection of strategies and, and products. So in the handbook, we describe um, a couple of different examples of these impact um, as well as investing goals um, that inform the theory of change. I'll just highlight a couple. Um, the first is that many asset owners are particularly now thinking about what it means to align their assets and their values. Um, and as Patrick mentioned earlier, all investments have impact. Um, we're choosing deliberately to value some of those impacts or not. Um, and part of what asset owners you know, are keen to do is align those um, more in terms of their, their values, in terms of positive behaviors, and, as well as how they act in terms of their philanthropy, their decisions as consumers, um, as well as as investors. There's other investors that are really concerned about systems change, that are thinking more broadly about how to get at some of the root causes of um, the inequities, inequalities that exist in society. And so they may have a very different approach than a values-based um, alignment approach. We've identified a couple of uh, different framing tools that um, investors could use. We talk about impact themes and impact lenses. And so just to highlight a couple of examples, themes tend to look like specific sectors, um, such as energy, health, climate change, education, um, can also focus on you know, specific issue areas um, or even sub-themes. Um, and so those tend to be particularly uh, related to specific types of sectors, which are a little different from lenses, which tend to be cross-cutting across the portfolio. And so as Patrick mentioned earlier, um, a lot of investors right now are concerned around issues of racial equity or gender or inequality. That would be a lens that you apply across all of your assets. And so in the chapter, you know, without spending too much more time on this, um, because we've done a couple of other webinars previously um, on theory of change, we also elaborate on how theory of change can be helpful to guide your impact investing strategy. It helps describe and interpret for both yourself as well as your stakeholders, you know, the, the map that Patrick just showed earlier, what you're trying to achieve, how you might do that. It also helps to manage expectations of your stakeholders and help you provide a kind of basis for how you might engage them and work with them moving forward. Theories of change can also be particularly helpful at the portfolio level to guide your portfolio construction, as we'll see in a minute and also help you understand where you might require further learning or research. And as we'll see in a few slides, help inform what kinds of approaches you use to measure and manage for impact. So what does this mean for Sophia? Um, we see that she's divided up her portfolio into these three buckets, both the entire portfolio where her goal is to do no harm. And she achieves that um, through uh, understanding what she's holding. Um, there obviously, there's a much lower intensity around impact um, when it comes to negative or positive screening, but she wants to understand at, at the very least um, how she's doing no harm across the entire uh, 500 million portfolio. Particularly for the foundation endowment and then for her program related investments, she wants to focus specifically on areas such as water, climate and the arts. And as we'll see later, there's more specific um, areas of focus, both sectorally as well as the lens that she's applying around gender. Commensurate with that, there are different expectations financially, um, as you can see on the right-hand column. And we're gonna see shortly how that actually translates into her choices when she thinks about portfolio construction and how it relates to our overall impact goals. So part of what we talk about um, in the handbook all the way through is how you make these choices of finding the best balance between your financial and impact goals and also how that may evolve over your journey um, as you deploy different kinds of assets and the mix of your assets. So I hand it over to Patrick to talk us through the how section. Great, so this is the, the meat on the bones. And if we had to pick one chapter that really adds unique value, uh, this would be at the top of the list. Uh, the idea here is to take your theory of change and add in your impact tools and your impact structures. Uh, which will then lead you to your investment policy statement, which may be one statement or it may be two statements integrating 
uh, your traditional financial in in investment policy statement with an impact investing statement. So the question is, what are tools and structures? Uh, tools can look, look like things like uh, screening or shareholder engagement. Think about ESG integration or going deep on one theme. You can also think about catalytic concessionary capital, which you'll see Sophia approaches with her, the payout of her foundation and setting the time horizon of the impact that you're trying to see as well as the financial returns. When we talk about impact structures, we think about three main categories. One is the investor structure. So you as the asset owner, what structure are you choosing? And that would be uh, inclusive of the donor advised fund that may you want to focus on anonymity. It could be the LLC model, which has gained in popularity. And that would be a focus more on flexibility and then the more traditional private foundation. The intermediary structure is how do you actually make the investment? What's the structure of the investment itself? So thinking about equity, debt, where does it play on the capital stack to, to achieve the, the impact goals that you wanna see? And then third is the enterprise structure. So the investee, what is their structure? And a lot of conversation related to benefit corporations and these more hybrid um, structures, but also the traditional for-profit and non-profit models are very applicable. So one key element here is the products. Once you've got your tools and structures, how do you actually layer in specific products? And this particular chart was the most used in the version 10, year, 10 years ago. This is a cutoff because it's quite large and, and it's, uh, it, it's long. So you can think about the left side as the impact theme and across the top as the asset class. And the rows on the actual version in the handbook go down roughly 10 rows of different themes. And the idea here is that given whatever impact theme you care about, where can you actually participate with each asset class? And certain themes like climate have a lot more depth and the ability to have a diversified portfolio and some like water maybe have a little bit uh, less of an ability to do, do so. So the idea here is that 10 years ago, this was relatively sparsely filled out. And now with the advancement of a lot of uh, elements of the field, this is, this is completely filled out. Uh, still, there are more opportunities, more products in certain areas than others, but um, a lot of growth in this, um, to this particular concept. So how do you take these products and actually build a portfolio? This may be relatively basic, but I think it's important to mention. The first step, know what you own. So all investments have impact, know what's going on in your portfolio right now. The second thing is, how do you actually want to take the step? So the first idea would be to construct your impact portfolio. Let's say you had a, a recent financial event and you've got quite a liquid portfolio. You can start constructing your portfolio from scratch. The second is more portfolio driven. So you're taking an existing portfolio and you're transitioning it slowly over time. And then the third is a carve out. And this is quite common uh, with foundations to take a little slice of the endowment and to begin thinking about mission related investing. Uh, you can also use a very specific tool in this case. So how has Sophia taken this on? And uh, realize this is a little bit small text, but to focus on this, we've taken the theory of change, which is essentially the first four columns and we've added on both tools and structures and then specific products that she's working with. So across her whole portfolio, her main goal being do no harm. She really is going to focus on working with her advisor to help screen for ESG integration. And she's going to discover how she might do that. What are the possibilities uh, to keep that maximized financial risk and return as the key consideration and then layer in her impact goals. For the foundation, she's really focused on water and uh, climate and gender. A key point here is that she started with water and said, gosh, wouldn't it be nice to have a diversified portfolio focused on water, but she hit a few barriers. And so the idea is she's got concentric circles outwards to say, actually, if climate is uh, the category that can be more diversified and can have a more of a full opportunity set, let me expand that out where it's not possible. So if you go all the way over to the right side for the products, with water, her venture capital is gonna be focused on water technology, for example. Uh, but yet her public equities and her endowment will be focused a little bit more on the climate space and then we'll have the gender lens layered into it. For the foundation payout, it's gonna be very catalytic, 
concessionary. She's going to start with loans to the charities she really knows best. And then she wants to start thinking about this creative economy or the arts and getting um, more, more attention given there's less than 1% of impact investing to the arts by some measures. So now over to Karim to take on the, the measuring success element. Thanks, Patrick. And so as you're beginning to see, you know, so there's a lot more sophistication as we go from the high level, um, what is Sophia trying to achieve? What matters to her? What does she have to work with? How is that manifesting themselves across different parts of the portfolio? Um, and then when we get to the measurement um, questions, what we've suggested is, again, a lot of this is anchored in, in your theory of change, uh, but there's also a sequence of questions that you can ask yourself um, through how you describe what impact means um, in, in a somewhat logical way. Impact measurement can feel somewhat daunting to folks. It, you know, as we've talked about, for example, in our last webinar um, on the state of IMM, impact measurement and management in, in impact investing, practices are still somewhat new, somewhat fragmented, but encouragingly, you know, growing in sophistication and adoption. And so when we think about the process by which impact investors can understand the effects of their investments on people and planet, you know, both the, the measurement piece as well as the active management piece. How do you adapt your processes and how you improve outcomes moving forward? In this chapter, what we've tried to do is provide some initial starting points and tools with the expectation that these will be improved as the field matures. So we've tried to provide the best guidance that we have so far um, and then the kinds of questions you could ask yourself in the right order. And this really mirrors how we teach um, this content in the Oxford Impact Investing and Impact Measurement programs. So we think three core components are critical, having a consistent and disciplined approach, transparency in your processes of impact due diligence and reporting, and the use of appropriate approaches and tools. So not one single approach or framework or standard is going to get you everything you need, but the idea is to have the right combination of them um, that are appropriate to your circumstances. And so we asked these three questions um, that mirror the broader guidebook around why are you measuring, what are you measuring, and, and how are you measuring? When we talk about the why, we get into um, the questions around what you want to prove in terms of your impact, what you may want to improve in terms of your outcomes, and some things that you might still want to learn. And many asset owners that are going on this journey for the first time probably have a, a set of defined learning goals beyond just thinking about reporting on their impact. And so we think that that's important to get the balance right, depending on your sophistication. Um, it makes it much easier to identify what you should be measuring and then how you should be measuring. On the what, we've described at least these three organizing categories of principles, frameworks, and standards. When we talk about principles, you could think about them as overall rules and best practice to ensure the integrity of your processes and behaviors. We highlight a couple, including the recent uh, IFC uh, principles. When we talk about frameworks, there's a range of them. We highlight the SDGs, uh, the IMP, Impact Management Project, as well as, as others. And then we talk about standards as well, including things like IRIS um, and SASB. And what's important here is that what is this combination that's right for you what we've done in the handbook, um, and we won't spend too much time on this, but we've talked about this in previous webinars, is that there are lots of places to get started. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, a lot of the frameworks and tools that we now see are actually interoperable. So they engage with each other, with each other quite nicely. Um, and it's important to just understand that this is an iterative process. So start somewhere and then think about how you might get better over time. Many investors have questions around, for example, how do we think about collecting data, analyzing it, and then reporting it? We've highlighted the first graphic here, which comes from the Impact Measurement Working Group of the G8, whereas the second graphic here is looking at this question of how do you think about a portfolio approach to thinking about different kinds of impact and how you might, in a sense, aggregate all these up. There's also other examples that we've included around impact due diligence, around lean data, um, impact management project and, and others. So what we've tried to do here is to say, 
here are some starting points, here's ways to signpost, and that you don't have to reinvent the wheel, but find the right combination um, for you. And we'll talk a little bit about this um, in a couple of slides as well. But let's make it practical. What does this mean for Sophia? As we talk about um, across her entire portfolio, you know, Sophia wants to understand and feel confident that she's doing no harm. And so her strategies here are to think about positive and negative screening criteria and the percentage of assets that can be screened against that. And obviously over time, you want to get to 100%. And so we've said that by year three, she wants to be confident that she can do that. But initially, even in year one, to establish a bit of a baseline against her ESG criteria, the IMPRI um, five dimensions and the ABC framework, as well as the IFC principles. So really, at start to just say, how do I map onto these? Where are my areas of strength and weakness? And what do I need to work on to be able to feel confident that by year three, I understand what I hold and that it's in alignment with at least these three high level um, frameworks and principles. For her endowment and her PRIs, she has more specific goals. So for example, for her foundation endowment where she wants to apply a gender lens, she's still trying to figure out what it means to apply a gender lens. There's a lot more gender lens research that is coming out, including tools, et cetera. So one commitment that she's making is that understanding how can all the data that she gets from her asset managers be disaggregated by gender and help her understand um, perhaps how to create a scorecard with some custom metrics to understand the gender implications across her, her holdings in the endowment. So here it's both a high level understanding of the research insisting on getting gender disaggregated data as much as she can, and then being able to create some custom reporting for herself um, that again, over three years will improve. And as we go down to the PRIs, she's got a specific focus on water related enterprises. There she wants to really understand how to improve community level outcomes and the investees that she's deliberately targeting through Catalytic Capital, how are they targeting and serving underserved populations? There she might choose to apply, for example, lean data, and help her investees um, understand what baseline and follow-up survey data looks like, both quantitatively and qualitatively. So as you can see, this is just one set of examples that go from high-level portfolio to specific pools of capital using the lens to then thinking about outcomes for specific populations. So that was a bit of an overview. I'll pass it over to um, Patrick to take us quickly through the last chapter, and then we'll get into a bit of discussion for some of the themes and issues that have come up across the handbook. An invitation to, to keep uh, posting your questions in the chat function. Uh, there's some really good ones that have come in so far. So the question here is, how do I actually do this? Uh, we've set up the, the understanding who you are as an asset owner, uh, how you define impact investing, why you're doing it, how you're thinking about moving your portfolio, and how you're thinking about measuring success. What are the elements to actually take the first steps uh, or take um, the important steps to building consensus, for example, and how ready are you to make these moves? And so this chapter is really about moving forward and building towards an implementation plan. So thinking about, uh, for example, building a team, uh, and there was a question from Rick Fernandez, really good, who assists impact investors in developing theories of change? Great question. Uh, can be internal or external. Uh, could be a very low hanging fruit, start with the basics and what you know and test it out or it could be as sophisticated as bringing in uh, an expert consultant or advisor or another um, aligned investment manager to help you develop that out. Uh, but what are the considerations on the type of team you might need if you're an institution or what kind of uh, roles and responsibilities or processes and systems might be necessary to shift from a traditional investment portfolio to layer and impact? Uh, there's also a really important discussion on legal considerations in this chapter. So how do you think about fiduciary duty and the misconception there that you cannot actually achieve both financial returns and in impact investing? Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to dive into this chapter and to think about this. But the idea is getting really specific best practices on moving forward and developing the first steps to, to take action. Uh, for example, Sophia is really going to focus her consensus building on um, her husband, because he's really the, the key uh, bottleneck, if you will, for the next steps for her portfolio. And so she's going to have conversations with him and really engage her family attorney to help understand the fiduciary duty angles. Um, 
So that's the, the implementation plan and over to Karim to really um, start the discussion and, and maybe we'll start with the, the IMM piece. Yeah, thanks Patrick. And so um, what we've tried to do again is, is give you good value for money and compress 180 pages into to 30 minutes. That was a very quick um, overview of each of the, the chapters and, and some highlights. Um, what we'll do now is, is maybe have a bit of a broader discussion um, around some of the themes and, and questions um, that have come up. And let me start um, a little bit by just also, you know, describing some of the things that uh, I think are important to consider when we're looking at the IMM strategies. And then we'll come back to how this handbook could be helpful depending on where you are in your journey. And so one of the, the important messages, and for those of you that have joined uh, previous uh, measurement webinars, with us, you'll know that uh, we've talked about some of these, that IMM is really about making choices. Um, and it's about making choices appropriate to what your goals are, to what you have to work with. And we've also seen this is, is true um, with Sophia. You know, as, as she's embarking on this journey, she's making a set of choices based on what it is that she's trying to do, what she defines success as, what she wants to learn, and then the kinds of tools um, and assets that she has to work with. And when we think about what it means to make choices in IMM, IMM um, we highlighted a few uh, different aspects. So the first is um, coherence. And it's, so it's really important to understand how impact considerations work across your investment processes. So everything from your theory of change to how you set up your due diligence to how you think about decision-making and governance um, to how you think about post-investment reporting the processes really matter. And so sometimes we see that impact investors spend a lot of time at the front end, you know, defining a theory of change, for example, but that doesn't really make its way into all parts of the impact due diligence or investment selection processes. And so coherence really is really important. Triangulation is another concept um, that we've talked about in the past. It's really trying to understand what is this balance of numbers and narrative of different kinds of evidence to understand not only what is happening, but also why it matters and how it matters and to whom it matters. And so when you bring different kinds of data points, you're really trying to construct a story and give you more confidence that the impact that you think is occurring or that you hope is, is occurring can be somewhat verified by the ability to look at different data points that back up that claim. Um, and that can be sometimes difficult depending on the kinds of investments you're making, but it's an important principle to think about. And also um, a lot of questions we get is, is do I lean on metrics? Do I think about stories or, or narratives? And obviously the answer is you have to find a balance between, between those two. It's also important to think about decision utility. So a lot of the time when we think about impact measurement, we tend to frame it as, as reporting so that an investee or an asset manager is reporting back to the asset owner. Um, but it's also useful to think about this as how you might use impact data to be able to make decisions moving forward. You know, as we've explained, you know, with Sophia's example, this is a management process. It's a portfolio construction and portfolio evolution process. And so regularly review the kinds of data that you're getting, think about how that will inform your forward looking decisions, both in terms of where you invest as well as how you invest. Another important consideration when making choices is proportionality. Um, all of us would love more information around impact. Sometimes it's just not available or it may not be available based on the kind of investment or investee, whether it's their capacity, how much investment you're allocating, and also importantly, how much information is enough. You know, in the course we talk about getting enough precision for the decision. How much information would you need on impact reporting to think about whether or not you should invest, whether or not you should invest more, or whether you're convinced that there's actually impact occurring or maybe even negative impacts that you're not aware of, how much would you need to know in order to make a decision? Of course, more is better, but sometimes we just have to be realistic about that. And so proportionality is an important consideration when we think about measurement. And then finally, Many of us are on this journey of thinking about IMM in terms of what are these choices that we're making? What are we kind of trading off in the short term? How are we still being consistent and truthful to our long-term goals? 
and how do we ensure that we're field building? And so sharing your approach, your performance, and some of your learning is an equally important component of what we try and stress as we think about what good IMM practice looks like. So those were just some highlights and maybe some general guidance as we think about how we make choices. And as I said, in, in the specific chapters, we provide a lot of the, the approaches um, and signposting to them. Patrick, maybe a couple of questions for you as we step back now and think about the overall handbook and, and how it can be useful. Can you talk a little bit about what the handbook would mean, for example, for newer or more aspiring impact investors, let's say, versus those that are established um, and how they might use some of the chapters um, or lessons differently? Sure, thanks, Karim. And, and um, Sophia is kind of an interesting example because she's a little bit in between. And so I think taking some of her, from her example is uh, gonna be important. Um, when you're newer, uh, frankly, it's starting with the low hanging fruit. So what do you know really well and how do you add a layer to that? So if you're coming from an investment perspective and you know public equities really well, you know research really well, then think about um, making a decision related to ESG integration, add that additional consideration to your public equities and start there. Uh, there's no, no reason to switch over to catalytic concessionary loans to grantees if that's not your focus. Um, and on the flip side of that, if you are really a programmatic focused person, if you really are excited about um, the, the direct impact of particular companies or social enterprises, then start there and get really involved and talk to founders and understand what makes them different from others. Um, and then if you are really uh, like Sophia, understand your grantees really well, start there. Uh, the, the key is to start and iterate. There was a, a great point on, uh, on the Q&A from, uh, from um, Tanuja, which is should, should this not be iterative? Absolutely. So start somewhere and iterate. Uh, don't let the, the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, perfect is not even possible in this, in this world. So start with the things that you know well and iterate on it. Um, finding good sources of inspiration and peers is also critical so that you can bounce ideas off of. Frankly, we hear it time and again that having one or two close allies that are maybe a few steps ahead of you are more important than um, even webinars like this, frankly, um, or conferences. It's to be able to call someone and say, look, I'm looking at this particular deal. I'm thinking about this strategy. How uh, can you help me think about it? Um, for more advanced uh, you know, impact investors, I think it's not dissimilar, but uh, make sure you're, you're applying the lessons learned uh, to, to what you're doing. We often see with those that are a little more experienced, we, we don't see the connection between the theory of change and the IMM framework as closely as, uh, as it ought to be. So to all these points that Karim is making, how are you looking at what you're measuring and making sure that that is exactly tied one-to-one -one with the goals that you set out with your portfolio and tightening those connections uh, when, when possible? Thanks, Patrick. And I see we've got a lot of questions coming in. So let's, let's try and get as many as we can in. And so I'll try and um, add a few responses. Um, and then Patrick, you can jump in as well. So we've got this question, um, how does this apply, for example, to the world of increasing passive investing? I guess the short answer here, I would say is that impact um, investing, almost by the nature of what it's trying to do, um, is much more active. Um, but, you know, we've identified within that the handbook that, you know, at the very least, as you think about ESG strategies and doing no harm, as we've talked about with Sophia's example, you should be able to understand what you own and to be able to ensure that it's at least not inconsistent with your values um, and that you think about how you move um, some of those strategies to be perhaps more consistent. Um, and, and I found, for example, the IMPs framework, the ABC framework, you know, and thinking about the contribution of, of your portfolio that's, for example, in the A's, um, you know, which might be more passive, for example, how can some of that be allocated in, in the kind of B's and C's to be more actively engaged in, in building better solutions for, for people and planet? So I think that you know, that's probably a short answer and that's a much longer discussion. Um, let's maybe a couple of other questions. Rick, this was a really good, good one around harmonizing reporting and impact time horizons. Um, and I think this is one of the questions 
uh, for impact investors as a whole, you know, we often describe ourselves as patient capital um, or patient investors. Um, and as you've noted, sometimes that the kind of financial return aspect, you know, if it's a one, two, three year um, time horizon versus where impact might be accrued, which might be five or 10 years, perhaps, especially if you're looking at systems change. I think one of the questions for impact investors is, is how do we think about longer term outcome measurement um, and longer term holding periods for certain kinds of vehicles? And then thinking also about how we can get better at triangulating different types of data. And so not only looking, for example, at um, kind of higher level metrics, but also thinking about getting more insight into beneficiary level perspectives earlier in the process rather than waiting you know, three, four, five years out. So we can actually get some initial insights around whether there's a higher probability that outcomes will be achieved. So I think that's a, a kind of broader set of issues that um, hopefully impact measurement sophistication will be able to, to address. But I think I would agree with you um, that right now there's a bit of a gap um, between that. And I would hope on, on some future webinars, we're gonna pick this up in terms of some specific um, examples. And then maybe I'll answer one more um, and then Patrick, turn it over to you to, to kind of pick up on a couple. Um, there were some questions around <clears throat> theory of change, how it's more iterative. I think Tanuja had this question as well as um, talking about a theory of change for a specific impact theme. So yes, theories of change should be iterative. You should bring what you're learning, for example, and feed that back into updates onto your theory of change. Um, and certainly you can build theories of change for specific impact themes. And as well, many um, impact investors, particularly when they're making deeper, more substantive commitments, do theories of change for individual investments um, as well. So it can vary depending on the kind of investor you are and how hands-on you want to be in the process. Patrick, uh, maybe over to you to answer a couple. Sure, I'll try to consolidate some of these into, into my comments. One, just to make sure that we're, we're saying something related to passive investing and even, even how does this apply to ESG, this is not new. So this concept of impact investing has been going on for uh, you know, centuries, if not millennia, with, with religious and values-based investing, particularly with, uh, with negative screens. So uh, the field is, it continues to evolve. One comment related to ESG and how does this apply here, um, one big misconception related to, to ESG is that there is a defined uh, definition of the E, the S, and the G. It, but it's actually no different in one sense from grant making and how you define impact in that case. It's a worldview decision that's based on what you prioritize. And so either developing your own or really picking what's out there from the MSCIs, Sustainalytics, Morning Stars, et cetera, to, to see where you align the best and where you want to focus. Um, we see with ESG, it's really the easiest way to feel confident in the quote, do no harm. If there are areas of your portfolio where you're not as focused or not as well versed, um, but there's a full range of tools there. So you can screen out related to, to the E, the S and the G. You can tilt the portfolio to the positive in certain areas. You can go deep on one theme uh, you're, or you can go even deeper and, and, and use your ownership stake and, and uh, engage as a shareholder um, and be really a lot more involved. Uh, one of the questions was related to um, sovereign, sovereign debt. And while I'm not a sovereign debt expert, um, I'll actually post one of the a really good uh, resource here from the UNPRI, but traditionally sovereign debt is, is been considered a risk-free asset class. So it's interesting to think about, especially in these times, how do we layer in something like ESG integration considerations to sovereign debt? There is less uh, data av availability um, in this particular focus area, um, but it's not, again, not dissimilar from taking ESG, what do you care about and applying it uh, to, to sovereigns? And I think there's more information there. I'll post that in the, in the chat to make sure there's uh, this follow-up. The final one that I'll take on is this idea of consensus building from Jennifer. And, um, you know, this is this, the art of the science with impact investing. And we see as we're working with asset owners, this can be the hardest part. Maybe a next gen uh, family member comes in and says, we wanna, we wanna talk about impact investing for the first time. Um, how do you actually build consensus? So we've got a section in that last chapter of how do you do that with a few case studies. A couple high points, really tailor your approach and language to who you're talking to and meet them where they are. Um, 
really leverage advocates. So for Sophia, it was the family attorney, but who are the, the partners and the stories and the data in particular that really support your case? Um, try to really focus on merging these often separated finance and impact con considerations in a really compelling, uh, whimsical way if you can. Um, and then use your existing investments to, to trigger the conversation. So if you point to maybe something that's already in the portfolio and say, look, this is already having an impact based on some news story, et cetera, maybe we do or don't like that, how can we shift that towards uh, what we do care about? Great, thanks, Patrick. Um, so we'll try and get through maybe a few uh, measurement questions um, and then we'll do one final go around. So um, Ruby had a question around uh, quantitative assessment of impact. Um, we're seeing that there's, there's a lot more interest um, in these areas. We talk a little bit about it in, in the handbook. I would say, um, you know, I'm, I'm a little cautious, I think, around assigning um, almost like quantitative um, aspects or, or monetization in some ways we're seeing, we're seeing this because investors are hoping perhaps for comparable um, data that they could make decisions on, you know, based on, on things that maybe have comparable units um, and, and in this case monetary because we don't have a standard kind of unit of impact as it were. I think we have to be cautious because impact means many things to many people. Um, and when we make some of these judgments around, um, let's say how we convert um, maybe a broad set of impact into one single measure for the basis of standardization and comparability, we risk losing out a lot of the richness and the distinctiveness of all the things that went into that decision. So as we've talked about, you know, Sophia um, cares about water issues gender lens, a racial equity lens, um, trying to boil some of that down into um, single uh, unitary metrics as a comparison tool, maybe um, strips out a lot of that rich thinking and the ability to understand how to engage with an investment over time in a variety of different ways. Um, and, and though that hasn't, I think, stopped the kind of enthusiasm for looking at some of these issues, we have to just approach them with a degree of caution. We're seeing many more approaches um, try and, and use these. Um, it's not new again, you know, we've got social return on investment that's been around for a long time. Um, but that would be, I think, one, one caution. Maybe one more question just around uh, measurement and maybe a couple of clarification ones. Um, you know, as we've talked about in the handbook, there are a lot of different tools, principles, guides. Um, this handbook is really directed at asset owners as they think about how they go through the journey and how they make choices. So it's a little different from guidelines such as the IFCs, uh, UNPRI principles, which provide you a sense of almost the, the kind of high level principles or rules um, that are only one part of your journey. Um, and so there's still a lot of questions around how you implement that in practice. Uh, Majid talked a little bit about uh, the relationship between impact and ESG. We should probably host a whole other webinar on this, um, but I think broadly speaking, the characterization you've made around ESG on the responsible side, do no harm, and then impact being much more around intentional outcomes, um, I think is, is right. Impact investing, I think, is also trying to be quite deliberate around looking at questions of negative impacts, of impact risk. We've talked about that on a couple of webinars um, as well. And so particularly in this time, you know, with COVID um, affecting many impact investments in a negative sense, impact investors have to be, be particularly prudent around the risks to impact not being um, generated, um, or at least how do you ensure that populations that are being targeted by impact investments are not more vulnerable, or in fact are sliding back into, into kind of negative outcomes. So I know we're coming up um, at time, um, but maybe Patrick, one more final go around on, on a couple of other questions, and then we'll do some closing remarks. Great. Um, I think on the uh, essentially the idea of this uh, talking about UNPRI, IFC's guide, uh, different principles, and and merging that with some of the the impact framework questions. Um, essentially, we're hoping that the approach we took to this handbook would be applied by practitioners. Essentially, um, only create something new if it doesn't exist. That's one big big thing. So we are integrating the UNPRI and the IFC's work in this and trying to make sense of it along the full journey. Um, and that's tied to existing frameworks. So um, unfortunately,
most asset owners cre create their own framework or, or um, approaches, metrics, and they're not tying it to existing ones. Either they're not doing the research to understand what's out there, or they're just so carefully focused on what they want to achieve. Um, that's better than nothing, absolutely, and to go deep into creating your own. We do want to encourage as much as possible, even if you're you know, 80% of the way or 80% aligned with the existing frameworks or structures or even taxonomies, we encourage you to join that framework, join that, that conversation and help participate and maybe even getting it to where you think it should be rather than creating your own and one more um, framework with really a, a proliferation of them over the last uh, few years. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so maybe let's, uh, let's kind of wrap up with a couple of uh, closing remarks. Um, I've typed in a couple of other um, responses and um, we'll try and see if we need to address any of the others um, when we send the follow-up email. Um, so Patrick, maybe, um, you know, in terms of uh, recapping what comes next, you know, this handbook um, is out there, um, it's 180 pages, as, as we've described, there's a lot of good guidance, a lot of good examples and case studies. So for those of you that are looking at who are the exemplars, who are the other organizations that are doing um, good work in this space and how are they approaching it, um, there's a lot of those. Um, and then we obviously, you know, have, as we've talked about these examples, both through Sophia and at the end of each chapter, a set of guiding questions that you could use to basically build your own plan. Um, any other comments, Patrick, just to kind of round us out around what's next? for the handbook um, before we, we wrap up? Sure, the, the first thing is to, to go and read it. Um, I know it's a long thing, but uh, I think it, it's, it's got a lot of good stuff, even if you wanna to skip to the, the areas you're most interested in. We would love to hear your feedback and even ideas of ways to collaborate, to adjust with that email address there. And then the next step is really with uh, workshops and, and creating a virtual academy that will allow this content to be in modules and applied to small group settings. Um, so if you're interested in, in uh, that conversation, we would welcome that as well. Uh, but really appreciate the time. Uh, thanks to Karim and for your participation and really great questions um, to, uh, to, to continue on this journey. Thanks, Patrick. Um, and we're so pleased that you, know, you could make this. Um, again, want to acknowledge the contribution from you, Steve, RPA, all the funders and partners um, on this guide. Um, just to highlight also, um, we've been doing these webinars um, roughly every month through the portfolio programs that we run at Oxford in impact investing, social finance and measurement. Some of the questions that I see have come up around ESG and around IMM in particular, we've picked up on in, in previous webinars. So I encourage you to look at our playlist um, on YouTube. This recording, uh, will be posted or sent to you uh, next week. Um, and so when you click on the link, you'll be able to look at the full playlist of our webinars and I think have more responses to at least some of your questions. We also wanna hear from you though. So please get in touch with Annabelle. Um, and as you saw the link um, on the previous slide from, from RPA, let us know what you think, how are you using the guide, um, feedback for us for this webinar and questions that you might have for future webinars or suggestions for future webinars because we take those into consideration as we think about what we're hosting in the future. I wanna thank all of you for being here. Hope this was a helpful discussion and uh, we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Thanks very much.